Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor today. I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. We have author Sean Robinson on the show today. And before we begin, I just want to give a quick shout out to dmaworld.com. They are a marketing consulting agency and they are owned by a gentleman named Mark. Mark believes that he wants the small businesses not to get robbed by those big marketing companies. He feels that, you know, he wants to help the little guy to show them how they can grow bigger without spending all those expenses that is unnecessary and unneeded. So um, go to dmaworld.com and ask for Mark. And Mark is there to help you along the way so you can grow your business into the size you desire and not have to pay a fortune to get to the areas that you are destined to become your true potential in life. So right now, I want to go back to Sean. Sean, tell us about yourself and a little about you, what you do, because before we were talking, you were, you were talking about a few different things, and it was amazing. I just want the whole world to know who you are about and what you do, and you have some great things to share. Well, thank you very much, Stacey. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here and, and share my story with, uh, with your audience and, and, uh, and, and talk about it. So I'm um, 39 years old. Uh, husband, I've got uh, three young children under 10 years old, and uh, I've just been really finding myself over the last couple of years. Uh, I've been able to do quite a bit uh, just by implementing some very, very small strategic uh, things, and and uh, it's it's definitely something that I think everybody can can pick up on. Now you were talking about. Um addiction and you know that's a really big topic especially with a lot of our our listeners because many people you know don't know how to cope with their emotions uh or they've come from you know a, a trauma a, uh, an, an area where they feel like they've gone through trauma in their life or they come from an environment that they grew up in that they had a lot of um little scars and wounds so to say and uh you know they resorted to alcohol or drugs or food as a comfort and source. Now, you know, you were mentioning that there are ways that you could overcome addiction and that you don't have to rely on drugs and alcohol and food to, to soothe those emotions and to cope with life on a daily basis. So what's your thoughts about addiction? And, and, and what do you do if you find yourself in a, in a, in a hole where you've become addic addicted to drugs or alcohol or food and you're using it as a, as a coping mechanism? I think a lot of the time we we may not realize that we're as addicted or that it's affecting us as hard as or as much as it is. Mm -hmm. I know when it came to my my drinking and, and my relationship with alcohol, I didn't realize how problematic it was until I stepped back a bit and started to, 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 to do a dry January and to get away from it. Then I could look back and be like, you know what? Like I, I was negative, I was cynical. Uh, I was very miserable. I was starting to yell. I was, I was definitely becoming a version of myself that I didn't appreciate when I was growing up, yeah. different things that, that, uh, that I grew up with. And, and I think once we realize that as, whatever it is, it could be sugar, it could be whatever. Once we realize that it's, it's making us become a different person or that, it, that it's causing us to do something that, that isn't productive or isn't yeah. um, healthy then we should really focus on whatever that is and, and start to, to make some changes. And I think it's so true. A lot of people don't realize when they've become addicted to, you know, drugs, alcohol, or food, you know, they go along and they keep doing it, the repeated behavior because that's all they know. And they don't realize until they hit rock bottom for many people. And some people, you know, they don't realize, but they've hurt a lot, a lot of people along the way. Now, were you uh, addicted to alcohol or drugs or food for a long period of time? Can tell us a little about your background, if you don't mind, just so people get a feel of, you know, how it all started and when it began and, and how you realize it actually became a problem for you. Okay, so alcohol has always been around my entire life. My my parents were were married. They had they had kids when they were young. They were twenty years old when they had me. I have two younger brothers, and we grew up with just they had a young lifestyle. They had young friends. We were safe, but it was just an abundance of alcohol partying around all the time, and it was normal to us. We weren't drinking it. We weren't involved, but it was just normal to have drinks flying around, messes the next day. 
you know, we had little games we played with counting how many beer cans were in the bag and who got the closest, mate got some of the deposit money. It was just, it was yeah. normal and it was innocent. But I knew how to mix a drink when I was like eight years old because wow. it's fun. You're going, you're helping your parents, you're mixing a drink, here yeah. you go, dad, whatever. And it's innocent, but it set me up. They didn't mean to, but it set me up for this like acceptance of it early on. And then like a rite of passage, it was like when I got to my turn and in Ontario where I'm from, it's 19 years old, but it was a couple of years before that. It was like 16, 17, I was having drinks and it was okay because I was safe, I was at home, whatever. But then, you know, that only set me up to try and be like the examples I had, the yeah. abundance around, the fridge was always full. Uh, my dad's a mechanic. So if he, he was doing work in the garage and he wasn't taking, he didn't want somebody's money because it was a small, nothing job. They'd bring him a bottle of whiskey or, you know, there'd be a case of beer show up at the house. And yeah. it was just such a normal thing. And as I grew up, um, I, I, I just, that's what I knew to be true. So I started my own habits, my own routines based on what I learned. And I, I worked at the liquor store when I was in college and, and just the abundance of stuff there. And, and, oh, I got to try this stuff. I got to try that stuff. And, and even though I wasn't buying big handle bottles of it, it was just always around. And then once I started to go, you know, we go camping or go to a wedding or concerts or something like I was like zero to 60. I, I was like mission drinking almost because that, that um, buzz that I remembered from college or from the end of high school or whatever, uh, it's like I was chasing that. And I know this is a true statement, but I know I was chasing that every time I went out and I was drinking yeah. too fast. I'd, I'd bypass it. Right. So when I was, so as I grew up and I had this toxic relationship with it, you know, I, I work construction as an electrician and I, and I volunteer fire department. I've been on for for 20 years and while we you know we never mixed the two but I hung out with the same people and we're yeah. not on call and it was just a lot of that lifestyle everywhere I went from family to to friends and co-workers and whatever and it was almost like because I worked in those industries I had to come in on Monday with my own hangover stories and my own drinking stories and and really live that that lifestyle yeah. that I had already honestly come by and I was like the biggest participant. I was, I was, you know, buying my rounds and then some, I was, you know, encouraging shots. I was the last one up. It was, right. it was a very, it was, I call it, it was a toxic relationship with it. And and yeah. while I never felt the addiction part because I didn't realize what it was doing, like I said, I didn't realize how toxic uh, it was making me become. Um, it was something that others as I started to get away from it yeah. they were like well are you an alcoholic are you are you, are you addiction it's like well how come you're trying to label it for me I'm just trying to figure this out but like I don't need you to do that for me yet yeah now when did you start to feel like this could be a problem like when did you come to some realizations where it started to hit you that this was not just you know casual drinking or friendly drinking with your friends and going out on casually that it was actually a problem um, well, with with COVID, first year of COVID, so the end of 2020 um, and all of 2020, it was it was just progressively worse. You know, we were there was this shutdown orders. There were, the liquor stores were always open. Um, we had Zoom parties with my friends. Even the fire department, they, we stopped doing training. We could, every once a week we do training, so they stopped doing that. And then yeah. we were still on call, but it was it was like there wasn't many calls because they were trying to limit the people going out. And through that year, because I wasn't going anywhere and I still worked, so it didn't affect my work, but right. um, all year, it just got progressively worse because it was bringing home booze all the time. We had these Zoom parties, uh, wasn't going anywhere. Maybe the next day, none of the extra clears for the kids or myself were happening. So as that year went on, it got worse. And then right. with food, it was just as bad because I was you know, we were, we weren't going out, the gyms weren't open. Yeah. And if I was drinking that much, I was eating that much too. And by the end of 2020, I was 320 pounds wow. and just miserable, I physically, mentally miserable and just needed something to change. So I just did, I had, I didn't know what else to do. I was, you know, dark, depressed, desperate. I, I call it my rock bottom because I just needed a change. I didn't know how to do it because I, 
come from these these toxic masculine tough environments that you can't show weakness you can't talk about it so yeah. I had to fix it myself I thought I had to fix it myself and by fixing it myself it made me more lost I, yeah. I didn't know how to do that I started a journal uh it was a place for me to just vent uh no judgment um just brain dump, beat myself up, whatever it was to just get these thoughts out. And it was in that, that end of 2020 with the, those thoughts where I said, I need to do something. Something's got to change and it needs to be something I'm committed to. So to start 2020 with those thoughts down, with that that mindset that led me to the end of, of that year, um, I made the decision to do a dry January as my resolution, mm -hmm. uh, starting January 4th, because it was everything I could do to put it off as long as possible. Yeah. Of 2021. So did you reach out for any additional support or was it something that you just came to a realization and you said, okay, this is has to stop and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and it started working for you. Or did you reach out and did you try to find some outside support? It was a bit of a slow process at first because I just was confused and I didn't know how to go about fixing it Yeah, um, because I felt like I had to fix it myself because I felt yeah. like I had to just suck it up and be a man because I thought all these things, my environments led me to believe it was that I couldn't reach out to those places, that those resources were for somebody else yeah. or because I don't have a, at the time I didn't have a religious spiritual background Mm -hmm. And all I knew of the programs that were available were very spirituality based. Yeah. I didn't feel like it was somewhere that I belonged, that I wasn't going to get the message or I wasn't going to feel. And it was the wrong thought. It was it was something yeah. I just assumed, but I didn't look into it at the time enough to really give it a serious thought. So by dry January, it was just something that that was like almost that Hail Mary for me to just do something to yeah. start the next year and when I started to do it it was almost easy because I mean I, I've been 320 that was the worst I've been but I've been up and down my whole life so yeah um I tried different things um went different periods of time I didn't drink every night it was it was not something that was just a constant thing but it yeah. was definitely part of that up and down that I had and by doing dry January, other people around me were doing their own version. They were doing their own resolution. They were doing whatever they needed to do. And the the hard part became about the middle of the month where people around me had fallen off. They weren't doing right. their things anymore. And then they were like, you're still going like, okay, hmm. right on. And then it was, it was also in that moment, mid January towards the end of January, where like, I have a 45 minute to an hour commute to and from work. Mm -hmm. So I was listening to the same music all the time. I got tired of the same playlists all the time. So yeah. I said like, I'm going to be doing this drive for a long time. I need a better use of this time. I always thought, you know, I didn't, I didn't read. I did well in school, but like, I didn't read for leisure yeah, and yeah. I didn't like do audio books. I wasn't into podcasts. I just, they weren't for me. I don't know why I thought they were for somebody else, yeah. but I thought, in that moment, I thought like, there's a better use of my time. So I started like, what if, what if I started listening to some podcasts? What if I started? And I, I started doing some, my own research because I couldn't talk about it to my friends yet. Like yeah. they weren't open to development and, and that space. So when I started to talk to that, or when I started to look into it, I was just finding anything that, that was something I'd like, you know, there's yeah. a hockey pl playlist, but I found myself in like school of greatness or, or these, these other podcasts that had celebrities and athletes and they, these people were coming on and they were talking about their struggles. They were talking about their books. They were talking about these things. And I felt I could relate a bit because I at least knew who these people were. Yeah. It wasn't the professionals, the doctors. It was, it was people that while I'm not pro athlete, at least I know who this person is yeah. and when they talk about their mental health, when they talk about their struggles, I can at least pick up on that. And right. it, it was a, it started a massive wormhole for me that I went down where, okay, I didn't appreciate the Andrew Huberman's and, and the doctors and the professionals in the beginning. Right. I, I absorbed that in the end, you know, as I developed, it was like, okay, if, 
you know, Terry Crews or Kobe Bryant or whoever can talk about what they're dealing with. Yeah. And they talk about this next, this next person that's influenced them. Yeah. And then, then, then that, that person talks about their influences. I kind of get through these three, four levels of people that, you know, a- ended uh, up helping someone else. Right. That's, that's amazing. Did you find that you had to kind of decide who you were going to stay close to and maybe there were certain people in your life you you probably needed to keep a little bit of distance maybe they were a bad influence maybe they were pulling you down maybe they were leading you into temptation to want to kind of go the other route and maybe had to did you have to change your 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 circle of friends or maybe get the negative people out of your life and and bring more positivity into your life I think that happened naturally um in the beginning I was definitely worried because anything I started to read anything I started to look into yeah. was about removing people from your life it was about you changing your circles your, yeah. your five most the five most influential or the, the, the five closest people in your life or who you're going to become it was it was something I was worried about at the beginning because I, I didn't know how I was just going to x people from my life yeah so when I when I started in this space and I and I maintained through January into February um, learning about habits, coming to 60 days, and then choosing 100 days as my benchmark because yeah. of the, the lifestyle change that I was working towards and what I'd learned about changing lifestyle. Um, I just distanced myself a bit more from certain situations, but in the background, didn't want to, I didn't want to sit at home. I didn't want to be sitting by myself. I didn't want to not go out. I didn't want to give myself an opportunity to almost test the things I was learning and test the distance I was making. So I came up with a few rules for myself and they're in my book. It was like, you know, uh, one of my rules was just have fun. So like go out still have fun. But the way that I did that was, was to like, I brought a Yeti coffee mug, you know, it was just this mug that I called my security blanket uh-huh. and I could, I could put whatever I wanted into it. Right. It right. was like, I could pour water or whatever Gatorade didn't matter. I yeah. could put it in there and I, it was still the mechanism. It was still that I was sipping on something. I was standing around because I had been on the other side of it. I was the biggest, yeah. you know, participant before. Right. So whenever somebody was standing in the corner, cradling a bottle of water you knew that person was standing over there judging everybody else for the what they were up to yeah so being aware of it from the other side I was like I don't want to be that guy in the corner yeah upset that I'm there looking for the first opportunity to leave I'm just showing face yeah. so it was like you know if I bring this cup with me I could put whatever I want in it and just do my thing um, one of my other rules was I didn't want to pretend. So I didn't want to run to the the near beers and the, the mocktails and those things because I wanted to remove that mechanism completely. And then as I was doing that, like I realized that I was the only one that cared what was in my cup. Right. right? I was the only one that was that self-conscious about it. Yeah. People around me were just trying to be a good host. They were trying to just do what I was used to doing. They they knew yeah. me before. So I wasn't upset at my circle that I needed to X everybody from my life. It was like, right. I needed to show them who I was trying to become or that I meant it this time. So that I did give them an opportunity to learn what, like who I was now or who I wanted to be now. Right. And to answer your question, I think those people that, that weren't wanting to, or that I couldn't maintain a relationship with because it was all around my yeah. drinking, um, we just naturally distance a bit. Like I still run into people and it, and it's still a good time, but yeah. I just, I'm not going to those things all the time. So we just naturally grew apart. And in right. and, and the latter, I've grown closer to other people that kind of in there in the circles now that I'm, I'm growing into. And honestly, you know, I think too, is that people who, who care about you, people who like you as a true friend are going to accept you no matter what. You know, you don't have to fit their, their personal quota. You know, they're going to like you no matter what. And the, the people who, who don't want to accept that because you're not doing what they're doing because you're not, you know, making them feel better about themselves because following their, 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 you know, what their behaviors, you know, they're, they're going to distance themselves. Well, those aren't true friends. So why even bother giving a second thought, you know, and in a way it's a good thing, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it came with struggle too, because like my own brother, my own brother was like, I turned a beer down at his house. And this was a couple of months into this journey. Yeah. And and he was like, Oh, why you haven't got your coin yet? You don't want to drink because you haven't got a 
Bitcoin yet. Like, I'm like, don't, don't be like that. And, yeah. And like another friend, like he was in my wedding. We're really close. We actually fire department and work together. Yeah. But like, um, he was in my wedding and he, then he was getting married. So COVID had pushed the wedding off. Right. Um, and now they were able to have it, but they were able to have it in this window now that I'm not drinking. And once I got to my hundred days, um, I was like, well, I don't really think, and I, and I keep all this in my journal, which is my book. I'm like, yeah. I don't, I'm a hundred days. I don't want to be done yet. Right. Like I'm feeling good. I'm, I'm yeah. more patient. I'm nicer with my kids. I'm not yelling. I'm not doing all these things. I'm, I don't feel awful on the weekends and the mornings. And like, what if I can do this for a hundred, like, what if I could do this for the whole year? Yeah. And I, I'm thinking at the time, still writing about it being my break. Yeah. I'm just like, like, what if I could do this for the whole year? I'll never do this again in my life. Right. So I committed to the full year. But as I'm getting through that, and this wedding was coming up, every time I saw him, every time we had a wedding function, well, no matter what it was, the fittings, the gift things, the parties, you better drink at my wedding. Every time you better drink at my wedding. I don't care. You better drink at my wedding. And his wedding was like September, October. It was the end of right. September. So this was like nine months, almost 10 through the year that I'm committing myself to this change. And I'm supposed to show up at his wedding and be drinking again. And while I started it unsure, I maintained that I was unsure. I took each step as a, you know, a new milestone. The mm -hmm. year was, was my biggest one. Yeah. And every time that he said that I felt the most anxiety, the most pressure oh, because sure. I had to be this way for him. And because I had that, that old mindset before where I was the biggest participant and I was the, the you know, the biggest encourager and the last one up at night, it was like, I was letting myself down too. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was something that I shouldn't have felt, but it was just automatic because of, of all of the, the whirlwind that I went through with, with this much change. Now, a lot of people, you know, it's very hard for people to ha to grow thick skin. Most people have very thin skin. And when people say stuff like that, it really affects them really bad. Do you have any advice for people? Like, were you always, did you always have a thick skin or did, like you said, it didn't, did make you feel kind of anxious and, and upset. So how did you deal with people with that type of personality? Like, how did you overcome it and not let them get the best of you? Well, it's, it's definitely a hard group with uh, my construction buddies and firefighter buddies, that toxic masculine space and that feeling that I had to be a certain way Yeah, and the pressure, the pressure from those groups. Um, it was tough in the beginning. Like it's, it was definitely difficult. And I think no matter what our groups look like, whether they're, you know, that burly construction type that expects you to get drunk all the time or whatever, yeah, we feel that we feel the pressure from whatever group that we're involved with, no matter who they are. Right. So for me, it was one for someone else, it could be something else, right? It could be that business environment where yeah. the wine and the whatever is, is an important part of that social structure. And, and my advice would just be stay true to yourself, stay true right. to what you want to do. And, and, you know, you don't have to be that person that comes out and I'm not drinking anymore and then judging everybody else because yeah. we don't want that, right? Like, no. don't be the non smoker that hates every smoker right be the non-smoker that just wants to be a non-smoker exactly so be be a non-drinker that just wants to be a non-drinker and just let everybody do their thing exactly as far as as far as turning things down and as far as not doing it if it's important to you and it's who you are now if it's who you say mm -hmm. i'm not a drinker so i'm not going to drink then when people offer it to you you'll 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 just be able to tell them you say no no i'll have whatever and in the beginning, I could say, oh, I'm driving tonight, so I'm not. And people would be pretty quick to leave it be. Yeah. But once people started to learn that I just wasn't drinking anymore, it, they started, like my brother who asked me about my coin, he actually had some other options. He he got some sparkling waters. He got some, uh, when I started to, you know, have some of the near beers about the the 10 month mark, yeah. it was, uh, he, he had some at the house in case I, I was able to you know, in case I wanted one. So right. the people around me, as they started to learn what it was that I was doing, and, and th there was a lot more respect that came once they learned that this is just what I was doing now. 
Right. Exactly. That's, that's wonderful. And, you know, what kind of tips would you give people, you know, who are trying to like overcome that barrier that are having a tough time while they're in recovery? You know, do you have any tips for people like, you know, different coping ways of of getting through the temptations or getting through, you know, the struggles that you, you endure, especially in the beginning? I think no matter what, what it is we're working on, what we're trying to either add or remove from our life. Um, we need a substitute. Yeah. Uh, I needed a substitute by having that coffee mug with water or sparkling mm-hmm. water, whatever in it, because that mechanism of bringing the drink up and sipping, especially if I'm around other people that are doing it, yeah. that was just something that I could, I could use to get rid of that mechanism. Yeah. And then as I, like other things, like when I started to, to do more physical fitness and I started to eat better, it was, it was, doing instead of eating the cookies that I was eating that were adding to my weight and overeating you know the little things like portion sizes and leaving the the stuff in the kitchen and then bringing your plate to the table and not having all the the food around in front of you because then all the overeating I was doing was was more accessible it was it was like adding a barrier or adding an extra step from the thing that you're trying to avoid to make it um more make it easier for you to not do it right so like if you have a fridge out in the garage or you know the easiest thing is to not have it the house yeah but like me i've got three kids and there's snacks everywhere in every cupboard um i used to just eat whatever i wanted to all the time and then i'm an adult i'll just go to the store and buy them more for the lunches yeah but like it, it got to a point where i had to make it more difficult for myself like i had to put the the stuff in in cupboards that weren't right beside the sink or right beside the fridge or, you know, bury the stuff at the back, whatever it is for somebody, just, you know, if you don't want to do something or you want to do something, I just make it either more difficult or, or easier to, you know, to, to interrupt your pattern. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great advice. And I, you know, one thing I love is that you mentioned about journaling. I, I think jur- I love to journal and I think it's such a powerful resource. Maybe you, you know, you could explain to people how powerful it really is. Cause, you know, sometimes, you know, just by getting it out of your system and putting it on paper, it not only releases those, those negative emotions it builds inside, but it also could come help you come to realizations of, of things that you didn't even realize before. So what's your intake on, on journal and how powerful it is and, and what you think about it? It was, it was never something I ever thought of doing. It was always something that the, the my buddies at work were going to find out about. It was going to be this diary. Sean's keeping a diary and he's, <laughs> he's, you know, all the things people would like, all the things my buddies were going to say. So yeah. I wasn't telling anybody for the first yeah. bit. And As I started to do it, I didn't really understand yet the power of it. It was for me to just put these thoughts down that I wasn't going to have to defend later. You know, my wife's been great through everything. But if I was just to come out and say things that were on my mind that that I needed to get off my chest and like what what kind of worry would she have? What kind of because like she's not a therapist. So right. for her to then try and fix it or her to try and get me to a point mentally that I can um, feel comfortable or feel, you know, grounded. Yeah. This this journal was a place for me to just vent. It was a place yeah. for me to put my thoughts down that someone else didn't have to try and 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 you like try and give me therapy for, didn't try to have to give me advice on. And as I started and continued to journal through all these things, and I started to learn more about habits and learn more about all the stuff that I was working on to help me with with reframing my mindset and my routine, you know, I, I put these thoughts down, I put these ideas down, the things I tried, the things that maybe didn't work so well, and then I could look back on it later like we can in our journals and just yeah. see like, okay, I, I know that I felt this way last week. I can go into that journal and like, yeah. Oh, okay. When I felt this way, I made sure to set an alarm on my phone because by nine o'clock I'm leaving. Right. I, usually when you go to a party, anytime, you know, the later you stay the more obnoxious it gets. So I had whatever, whatever it was I had, people knew up front by nine o'clock I had to go. So I could make that appearance. I could visit for a bit with my coffee mug and then my phone alarm would go off. And I knew it was time for me to go because I didn't know what the rest of the night was going to bring, but setting those things and, and, and 
setting yourself up that way, setting myself up that way, just gave me enough to come to feel confident about what I was doing. Right. That sounds, that, that's amazing. That sounds great. Now you wrote a book. Can you tell us a little about the book and what it consists of? Um, so my book is called Going Dry, My Path to Overcoming Habitual Drinking. Mm-hmm. Um, this was my journal. I was I was keeping this journal, as we said, all throughout, writing down all these things that that I felt and thought and what happened, what didn't work. And and then about the in the nine, 10 month mark, my my friend's wedding was over. I was on a work trip with the guys. And it was, it was one of my friends was like, you know, how is it going? It was a genuine, how's it going? And I said, oh, I could write a book. And it was just an expression, right? For how much I had gone through to yeah. that point and all of the emotion I felt and all of the, the the different situations and I could write a book. And it was like, wow, like I've, I've journaled like extensively for 10 months. I've got all this content of what I went through, what, what, how I felt, what I didn't feel. And I started to think about the person I was in the beginning where I was at that rock bottom. I was at that, that zero point. I was feeling as miserable as I was physically, mentally, like I said, and it was like, this is something I could have used when I started. This is something that, that I needed when I started yeah. because I didn't feel like I was coming from that addiction space, even though i probably was right just wasn't ready to admit it yet or, or to realize it yet this is something that I could have used and I just it took me the last month and a half of that year that was my goal to really think about whether or not I was prepared to get vulnerable and share it yeah and, and let people in in a way that that would help that, that person that I was and and I decided to self-publish this book. It was, it's from my journal. It's, I made it 120 pages so that it's a small, um, basically straight to the point because I wouldn't have read it if it was 400 pages when I started. Right. So if I'm reaching out to who I was, it doesn't need to be 400 pages. Right. It's 120 pages. It's, um, it's not a picture book, but uh, it's definitely an easy read. And and it's, it's from judgment free because I wasn't going to judge myself and that's yeah. who I was writing it for. Right. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's an honest uh, reflection of, of the year from you know, a lot of it taken from my journal and, and uh, really takes me through, takes me and the, and the reader through that, that transition from being in that miserable point to, to being in a position where I've done these multiple cycles of hundred days for different things from brushing my teeth to drinking more water, to not yeah. drinking alcohol and eating, uh, awful it was uh it was a real depiction of that first um critical year of development for me now was it did it take a long time because you told me you had gotten to a point where you just were not happy with the person you become how long did it get you to to take to get to that point where you you started loving yourself again where you accepted who you are you like the new person you will become and you actually could say I love Sean. I love myself. I think it was, was, it was at least the first few months before I I got to a point um, with, with all the the confusion and without, you know, coming from that tough space, that masculine space and, and all those things, like there was way too much confusion. There was way too much. I felt I had to do on my own. And it wasn't until that, maybe that three month, that first hundred day mark where I started a a turnaround. I started to realize that maybe the hangovers that I had, and I was proud, I didn't get headaches, but the hangover that, that I didn't see was the three days of being miserable and impatient that followed that I didn't have anymore I yeah. wasn't wasn't feeling those hangovers the same way because I wasn't impatient and miserable and then I was losing some weight and I, I was I was feeling much better I had more energy like my daughter my two older boys and then my daughter's the youngest she was born in September 2020 yeah right, right about the time I was feeling as awful as I was and as she says she was growing and I was getting through this like I had more energy to to play with my with my boys and with her and just be that dad that I wasn't before right and and it was it was probably let's say that 100 day mark where where I started to like the person I was looking at in the mirror 
Oh, that's wonderful. And did you have to, in your, in your journal, did you set goals for yourself? Like once you get to this point, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this, or maybe like, you know, these are my, my, my short-term goals. And th this is my long-term goal. Like, did you set any type of mental vi vision? Cause you talked about resetting the brain and resetting your lifestyle. Did you also like looked in the future or did you just focus on the now? In the beginning, it was definitely, well, I guess it was, it was about the future because I knew I needed something. I knew it needed, it was drastic. It had to be, but it, it wasn't because uh, something else happened externally that forced me to that. It was, yeah. it was just my own thoughts, my own feelings about the person that I was becoming. And it was, it was while there was big goals to, to change, it was small. Like I, it was that I just need to get through January. Yeah. I'm not going to drink for January. I'm going to figure this out. January became February. It's a short month. So it was kind of like, Oh, I can do another 28 days. It's, yeah. it's okay. And then as I started to, to stock these mini goals, it became much bigger. It became like, I can do this for an entire year because yeah. from a hundred days, it's about a, it's less than a third of the way through. Right. So, right. I went from a hundred days to this big goal of, of doing it for a full year and with all that other stuff going on in the background. And then um, like, as I was working through that, like I had I said, I was drinking more water. I was exercising. It was my calendar in the garage as where my, we walk in and out of the house. Yeah. It's, it, it had like X's for one thing and circles and squares and oh, notches and cool. marks, like everything that I was working on that I was yeah. doing it was on a different part of that hundred day cycle, but everything meant something else. So right. if I didn't want to talk about it, if somebody came over like, Oh, what's that stuff on your calendar? I could tell them whatever I wanted. That's how many times I watered the grass or whatever. Yeah, if, yeah. I didn't, if I didn't feel like I wanted to be vulnerable with that person, like I could make something up, but I've maintained this. So everything um, like brushing my teeth was I, I didn't feel like I was doing it enough and, and I needed to get better. So every morning was a check mark. Every evening was a check mark. And I'm going to do this for a hundred days. And, and then at the end of that hundred days, just stop tracking it and yeah. see if that sticks. It's, it was a, it was a lot of experimenting, but then at that hundred day mark where I'd stopped tracking it, some things like brushing my teeth became, you know, this, this just new thing that I had to do. I'd be in bed and be like, Oh, I didn't do it yet. I got to get up. It's gross. Yeah. Or like, you know, drinking more water, it was like, you know, drinking these cups or jugs, whatever I had that were, that were my uh, goal for the day. Right, it right. It's like, it, um, I, I do it for that 100 day period, check it out. Certain things like I, I started to do more sit ups, it was like, I'm going to do some more stuff. So yeah, it started at one, I was going to do one sit up every night, right? One, it's a check mark on the calendar, if I can do one. Yeah. And then after a short, like a week, it was like, I I'm going to do, I'm going to do 10. And then uh, for 300 days or something like that, because I've been tracking it. Cause I don't want to fall off. I don't want to let that go. Yeah. I actually want to compound it. So I've been doing for 300 days, it's been 50 sit-ups. So every night before bed, I'll do 50 sit-ups at least sometimes it's 60, 70, a couple of days I get up to a hundred. It's just yeah. that one, just deciding to do one has now become 50 or more. Right. Oh, wow. I like that. So it kind of just, you, you, not only did your mind strengthen, your body strengthen, you just, you know, it, you just grew as time went on and you got better and better and better and better and stronger and stronger and stronger. And I, I think that's great. Now you were, we were talking about like retraining the brain before, and we were talking about also how, you know, sometimes it's hard for people to open up because, you know, like you were saying in, in your industry, it was a lot of masculinity and, and guys don't, you know, talk about certain things and they do, you know, to drinking was cool and you had to be like one of the guys and, you know, it was a hard, it was a hard atmosphere to, to, to work in, especially when you're trying to change your lifestyle. And it, it goes the same way for, for women also, you know, it's, you know, changing your mindset is, is not an easy process. You know, what are some tips you might be able to give people when they're trying, they, they do want change, but they, you know, they're, we put ourselves as humans in these habits. And a lot of times they're bad habits and habits are very hard to change when you're so used to doing the same thing all the time, it becomes, that's all I know. And to get your brain to actually break those habits can be very difficult, especially depending on the person and the, their personality. But what's your tips of helping people get through that? I think there's there's a lot of 
it, it's difficult, right? And, and and some of the tips that that I have are, I say it's difficult because I was led to believe through upbringings and my career choices and whatever that I had to behave a certain way. I had to yeah. maintain a certain lifestyle. I had to, you know, keep certain friends or like the thing that we have to realize is we don't have to do any of that. Yeah. We, don't, we can be construction worker, business person, whoever, and, and live a different life than the people around us. Right. We have, we have to be conscious of it, but if we're in a situation that we want to change, we can change if we want to, we yeah. just need to do the things that we, that, that get us there. Um, one great example is James Clear wrote Atomic Habits. And and he said that he, he actually says he doesn't set goals anymore. He asks himself better questions. And, like and one that. of the things that I started to do in that, in that mindset is, you know, his, his, his thought is what does this person do that I want to do? So example is if you want to be a runner, mm -hmm. say, you know, would a runner eat a box of cookies right now? Right. Would, would a um, business person, you know, drink 24 beer tonight? Like with just the kind of person that you want to be, you start to ask yourself, would this person do that? Would this person not do that? Would, would, so by asking yourself those better questions, I found for me, it was easier to turn down certain things or to, to do certain things like those sit-ups. It was because, you know, does this person that does a 320 pound person do this? Well, yeah, I'm going to eat these, these cookies, but does a person that, that is in good physical shape eat those cookies? Well, no. So maybe right. I'll have one or maybe I won't have any like it. So you start to ask yourself better questions. Um, the other thing is, if it like I've I've since lost a hundred pounds. I've I've it took me three years. Wow. But I've I've got to a point where I'm I'm officially weighed in at a hundred pounds less than I started. Oh and wow. That's great. I could have never done that if I set that goal, if I set that big goal ahead of time. Yeah. If I said I'm gonna be, I'm still not drinking, if I'm gonna be three years sober, if I'm gonna be a hundred pounds weight lost, if I'm gonna be any of these things, I would have gone back to my old lifestyle, just like every failed new year's resolution. Yeah. So the important thing, the advice I would give to you is, is break it down into smaller goals. You may want to lose that hundred pounds, but you won't get there if you can't lose 10. Yeah. Right. So exactly. if you can lose 10 pounds, 10 times, yeah. you've lost a hundred pounds. So break that big goal down yeah. much, much smaller. And your mind will think about how much easier not that it's all going to be easy because it still right. takes work, but you break it down into 10, you're only losing 10. You can yeah. work hard for 10 and yeah. then you can work hard for another 10. And then like the way I felt all of a sudden I'm at 60, 70 pounds lost. I'm thinking like, how cool would it be? Cause I had that much to lose. If I could get to a point where I've lost three digits Yeah. and, and like any goal, if you break it down small and you start to compound, you know, if you're at 20, 30 pounds, or let's say you want to read 10 books, just worry about one. Yeah. Don't even, don't even worry about one. Just, just sit down with a book and look at the cover. Yeah. Right? If you break that down in such a small piece and you reward yourself with that check mark on the calendar, or maybe it's like, I'm going to have this cookie, but I'm not going to have this cookie until I read five pages. Right. It's like those sit-ups. It's, it's, I gave myself a reward at one by marking it off. Yeah. But then all of a sudden I'm doing 50 or more a night. Yeah. And, and I'm feeling the same way about it. Yeah. I like that. That's a really good, you know, mythology, because if you think about it and you, in, in that retrospect, you don't, it changes your whole mind for not even wanting to do it. You know, if you like when you, when you said, you know, do, if you want that cookie at night and, and you want to eat it, well, you know, I'm really hungry. Uh, one snack's not going to hurt, but I do want to lose 10 pounds. And then you're thinking about, well, if I'm going to lose 10 pounds, do I really want to eat that cookie? You know? And then, you know, just like you said about the runner, you know, would a runner do this, you know? And so then your attitude, your, your mindset automatically starts to refrain itself and, and, and change. So that, that's yeah, really powerful. It, it, Cause it, it changes the the way you think about it. Yeah. Right? Cause, cause I don't, I can't eat just one cookie. I'm going to have a few. Yeah. So, so by introducing that first one, it's fine. And I mean, you've got to reward yourself. So if it comes down to it, it's not, I didn't lose a hundred pounds by never having a cookie. Like that, right. that mm -hmm. needs to be known because <laughs> it's important to, to live your life. It's important yeah. to do the thing. So right. 
you know, it, it's a lot easier to have that cookie it, once you've, you know, gone for that walk or done that exercise in a day, yeah. because you're not going to put all that weight back on eating that one cookie or that piece of cake at a birthday party. Right. right. So it's knowing when to celebrate, but it's, it's, it's also giving, giving yourself that accountability. And, and if asking yourself better questions says, you know, okay, I had that piece of cake or I've had that thing. I'm not going to have any more because a runner wouldn't, wouldn't overeat like this. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, uh, someone that, that it could just be some, a healthy person. What would a healthy person do? Right. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be that you're running or doing anything physical. It just be the questions you're asking yourself is what a healthy person do, do that or not do that. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now, where can people find your book? Uh, my book is available on Amazon. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it is available at the most bookstores, Barnes and Noble. Uh, it's on their website, um, Canada Chapters Indigo. Um, it's available most of those places. It's probably not sitting on the shelf. I'm not sure what kind of stock is is out there. I'm not a uh, high profile author at this point, but mm-hmm. uh, it's definitely available. Um I've got my website. It's available through Amazon, through my website, uh, seanrobinson.ca. And um, all my other content that uh, that I put out is is all linked through my website. Uh, I've got uh, lots of inspirational videos I do and, and all the, uh, I've got a blog and a weekly newsletter and it's all based through my website and through all my uh, social contacts. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Now, if people go on to your website, can they get in touch with you if they have some questions about today's show? Uh, definitely. Yes. Uh, I am I am a solo entrepreneur, whatever the, the thing is. Uh, uh, on my website, there's a contact me section. Everything comes directly to me. Um, I answer everything when I, when I can. And and uh, to the best of my knowledge, I won't uh, you know try to, to tell you things that, that I didn't live through or that I don't know. But um, with what I've been able to do with, with weight loss, with changing my mindset, toxic masculinity, getting away from some gener- generational traumas, any, any of the things that I've been able to work on and, and, and um, achieve personally. Uh, if there's anything that people want to, to ask questions about, I'm more than happy to answer through my website. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Cause I, you were telling me that you do a lot of different services and you have a lot of expertise in a lot of different areas that are all related, but they're d- different areas of under the underneath of the umbrella, which is great because someone can contact you for many of these things that you just mentioned. So that, that's, that's great. That's really great. Now I'll go ahead. I was going to say, and a lot of it is, I still have that commute. I've been three years of driving an hour to work to and from, and I've been finishing so many audio books and podcasts, and I've, I've been reading books at night before bed instead of playing on my phone and and so much content. And like, I'd, I'd come home and talk to my wife and say, oh, you got to listen to this episode. It's You got to listen to this episode. And she does not have that kind of time. We, we've yeah. got the three kids and, and, and like, she's trying just like other people, we we're all busy. Nobody's any more busy than the next person. Yeah. So not it not everybody has the time to go and listen to all this stuff or absorb all this stuff. And right. And a, and a lot of that is why I'm trying to give back to who I used to be because that person wasn't going to make the time for it or yeah. needed a bit of a push. Right? Yeah. I I would have needed a push. And if 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 anything that I can you know try on myself and and then try to talk about and share is is inspiring to somebody then then i can use what i've learned i can use the training i have to you know at least give enough information from the valleys instead of from the peak you know yeah. going through this stuff too i can speak directly and say you know this is what worked for me it might be a good start Oh, definitely. You know, I think, I think people get the most out of people they can connect to that have actually gone through something and then they have a story to tell and you learn from that person's story and you learn from what they did to help themselves. And I I find too, that you don't have to have the same exact story or it could be on a different topic. There could be one thing in that story that connects with you. And they could just take that one little piece and apply it to their life and it can make a huge difference. So it's it's amazing by being able to be an advocate like you and being able to have the the courage to actually come out and tell your story. You know, something like that could be so resourceful for, to another human being. And, you know, it, it could save someone's life, which is a beautiful thing. It is. And, and it, it took me a long time to 
you know, as I finished that year, that is my book to, to decide to put myself out there because like, there's a lot that, that, that we don't tell people or that, that we right. feel shame with. And, and I, I just, not that I don't care because it's, it's, it's who I am. So I acknowledge yep. where I've come from, but I know that we're all struggling. We're all dealing dealing with different versions. And, you yeah. know, if I gave, if I gave up alcohol and that was my catalyst to make a few more changes, alcohol to me could be something else to, to somebody else. They may not relate directly to the drinking and maybe yep. it's cookies, maybe it's something else, but at least the mechanism around it, the ways to handle different situations or, yeah. you know, the mindsets and attitudes, like a lot of that is transferable, no matter what it is you're trying to get rid of or whatever you're trying 100%. to implement. Yeah, that's so true. That's that's so very true. I I find it, you know, um, that like even with any type of addiction, it all falls underneath the same umbrella. I think sometimes, you know, people feel either guilt or shame, and that's why they they're afraid to come out. But once that, you know, once they get over that shame or that guilt, because the, society makes us feel a certain way, and you know, the stigmatism in society, and how because society tends to be very judgmental, people worry about what others are going to think, and they also worry, they also feel that they've made mistakes along the way, and they might have some guilt or some shame from those mistakes but we have to realize i think too that nobody is perfect we all make mistakes and we all go through different things in our lives and you know you know people have to realize that you know it's okay it's okay mm -hmm. you know and it doesn't make you any less of a person it actually makes you a better person i think yeah and and the unfortunate part with social media in this this generation that we're in is nobody's posting a lot of the negativity. They're not posting the struggle. They're not posting the fights. They're not posting that part of their life yeah. because we're putting up that, that image that we're seeing everyone else put up of yeah. these happy moments, all the good stuff. And, and it's a lot of pressure when we're feeling a certain way and we're flipping through because it's the evening and we're on our phones and, and whatever the app is but you're seeing all this smiles and all this happiness and these trips and all the stuff. And you're feeling, you know, down about yourself. Yeah. But like we automatically compare and it's not fair because every person has their own version of their struggle. Right. And, and as long as we know in the background, it's not to wish any on anybody. We're all dealing with it. Exactly. We, there is not a person out there that doesn't have their own reservations or their own, struggle that they're dealing with whatever it may be right. so we can't look at social media that way and think that people around us are perfect right but what we can do is we can accept the fact that we are not perfect like everybody else and just do what we can to work on ourselves right exactly. we can work on the things that we have control of i could work on taking that break from drinking and taking whatever else I needed in the process uh, to, to help me with that first small goal. Yeah. It's a huge step to get there, but we're not running marathons, right? We're not running marathons. We're just putting our shoes on. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I think that's so very true. And a lot of times social media, you know, they, I call it the Brady Bunch syndrome where they try to make everything look so perfect. And usually the, the social media that you see that looks so perfect is usually the opposite, you know, and uh, behind closed doors. And, you know, it, it, it's more important to be real. And that way, you know, people realize they're not alone. And mm -hmm. that's where people will get the most help is when they realize they're not alone. There are people out there suffering from the same emotions, the same tragedies, the same conditions, you know, and the, and the list goes on. But, you know, it's better to be real. And, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that's what we really because you, you don't hear a lot of stuff about coping with things. You hear more about, like you said, you have all these great things and smiles and this and that. But there are a lot of people out there hurting. And, you know, and we need, we need to really, you know, get the points across on how to, how to cope with the, the issues that, you know, people go through like addiction and weight loss, struggling with obesity and, and mm -hmm. things like that and, and going through trauma and, uh, and the stigmatisms in society and how they place a, you know, a, a effect on people's lives and so forth. 
So yeah. you're doing a great job, you know, and I, I commend you for everything that you you're doing. And, uh, and, you know, do you have anything before we go that any kind of tips or anything you'd like to say to, to our audience? I, I think the only other thing I would add is that we just need to be more patient. Mm -hmm. um, I think in this world right now with how instant everything is and how it's getting even quicker, it's, it's not something that we can put a timeline on that yes. in a week we're going to feel better. Um, we may not feel better in three months, but yeah. what we can do is start. And I know the programs are a lot about day by day, do this day by day, set the goal for, if you use the hundred days, just worry about right now, just worry right. about to get to tomorrow, have that hundred days in your background, because that's what you hope to get to. And then, yeah. you know, just, just add to it when you can, but be patient because it's probably going to take better part of that couple months or a hundred days before you're going to feel better before you're going to feel like you're making a difference before you're going to see the pounds come off before you're going to see you know yourself change it's it's yeah. do do it now and be consistent but give yourself that three month period or 100 days before you uh you stop or doing what you're trying to do that you know that's great advice because you know in our society everyone wants a quick fix and it's it's one day at a time there is no quick fix if it, if you think it's a quick fix it's probably not it's not going to work or it's not very good everything takes time and patience and yeah. that's so true just so be true. patient and keep going you'll you'll get there yes very true. Thank you so much. You know, this has been wonderful, Sean, and I wish you the best of luck with your book. And I hope to have you on real soon so we could further our conversation. But this has been a true honor. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yes, no, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. Have a great day. You too. Thank you.